Please. Today's gospel reading. Jesus is traveling once again, yet another week, kind of in the wilderness, apart from others, trying to spend time just with his disciples. And as they are walking along, Jesus asks them a question. Who do people say that I am? And they give all the standard answers that people were talking. Oh, you're one of the prophets. Oh, you're the great prophet Elijah, come back. You're a great rabbi, you're a great teacher. And then, then Jesus looks at his disciples and says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, that most precious of disciples, my favorite one because he is so like me, getting it wrong about 98% of the time, but once in a while coming through with total and clear brilliance, enough to make people take notice. Peter, in his impulse, which is also one of his characteristics, he's so impulsive. Peter says, you are the Christ. Recognizing that in Jesus, Peter is seeing nothing less than God and God's gift to human beings. The one who will set all relationships right, who will reconcile people one to another. Peter, that one who so often blunders his way, gets an A plus for a second. Because Jesus then begins the truth of how human beings accept God most of the time. That they see God and God's people as a threat to their own power, position, and place in society. And that that results in evil. And that ultimately it results in the evil of attempting to crucify God. Peter does not like what he's hearing. And impetuous Peter, always ready to put his mouth first, goes to Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, this is not my idea. This is not right. This can't be. And so Jesus tells him, you get me home, you save me. Immediately, it reminds me of James' lesson about the tongue, doesn't it? That once in a while, we can say something profound and moving and gracious and great, but we can also do so much evil when we open our mouths without thinking and contemplating first. Yesterday, I was on an all-day class meeting. Priests are supposed to take continuing education, so I signed up for a class presented by the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theology. It's a class via Zoom, um, and yesterday was an all-day session fascinating session um, and we periodically listened to lectures and then broke into small groups and um, small groups were groups of about 10 people and I found myself doing a lot of thinking and contemplating but not talking until the very very end when I kind of got caught out and somebody said Chris did you have anything to say and um and I, and, and I realized that I, I was listening but wasn't saying anything. And part of that was because I was taking in not only all that we were hearing from the lecturer, but all everyone was saying. And I was really contemplating and uh, struggling with some of what I was hearing. Um, and then I, I didn't speak because I figured I needed to participate in the class participation part. 
you know, as uh, and probably ended up speaking too much. Um, but one of the things that struck me then and 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 in two weeks we are going to begin doing a program called Sacred Ground, which is an opportunity for us through videos primarily, a little bit of reading, um, to to explore the gifts of all the people of the Americas, the indigenous people, the blacks, the Hispanics, the European, the Asian, and to see them um, and, and their gifts and their struggle, and hopefully to come to a deeper understanding and acceptance of how their experience shapes their current reaction and how our experience shapes our reactions. Because it is only as we come to understand the other person that we can ever hope to come to understand our country, our world, and to make it a better place. For me, that always resonates with a very personal story. And it does tie with the mouth and, and uh, you know, who do you say I am? When I was a teacher many, many years ago, and I noticed um, I, I got damned twice because, you know, if they warn you if you're a teacher, you're in trouble. And um, one of the little known facts is, is if you're a priest, when you die, normally when, when a person dies, you know, the casket is brought in and they are facing the altar, they're facing God. When a priest dies and the casket is brought in, the priest is facing the people because the priest is answerable to God's people for what the priest has done in their living and in their speaking. So I figured as, as I was listening to that patient, I don't have a chance, except I do, because whether we get to heaven or not, where we go, what happens to us, is not based on us or our worthiness, or anything we've done is 100% total and completely based on God's mercy and God's love for us. Thank God. Back to my story. When I was teaching one day, and I think it was, I know it was my third year of teaching. So I wasn't a newbie, but I was still new. And uh, you know, I got to the end of the day, and there was like five minutes before the bell rang. You know, I'm like, what can you do in five minutes? And so I, I just, I kind of said, kids, tell me, what'd you do last night at home? And um, I'll never forget the stories that I heard. One story, well, some of them I'm sure I forgot. But one story was, well, last night at home, my mom and dad got into a fight. And my, my dad started chasing my mom around the house with a kitchen knife. And my mom went to the to the wall to call the, the police, and my dad yanked the phone off the wall. And I'm like, well, and I was trying to teach you how to multiply all that today. Suddenly, I understood why this child was a little distracted. Another one spoke up and gave me not quite as, as uh, impressive uh, a story, but, but another story. And what I learned immediately was I consciously, I had always thought of these children as coming to school with the same experience that I had had when I went to school. And my image of going to school is my mother and father standing at the front door, waving with smiles on their faces as I trekked off to the corner, looking back and waving at them all confident. And Mr. Munson, the policeman that, that was assigned for the crossing at the corner, would take us safely across the street, and I would go another block to school. Not so the experience, obviously, of some of these children. And what I learned in that was that I innately presume that other people have the similar or the same kind of experiences that I have. 
and I act as if that is so. Where their experience may be very, very, very different. And that may lead them to have a different set of understandings and reactions to things. One last story to illustrate that. Growing up, we always thought that my maternal grandfather was a rich man. And for the day, he was. And so there was always the story that my mother and her sister were um, taken to school by their chauffeur. And that the chauffeur was shared with the neighbor and um, between the two families took people places. I always thought that was a sign of how wealthy they were. Man, they had a chauffeur. Yeah, we barely had a car. Um, until on my aunt's deathbed, she told her daughter, my cousin, that the reason they had a chauffeur was because they were of German ancestry, and this was World War I. Their last name was Hoffmeyer, and my Grandmother's maiden name was Bush, and the German names went on and on, including Cousin Adolf um, and Holga and Frieda, sisters. And so it turned out that the reason that my aunt and my mother were taken to school by the chauffeur was because they were being harassed and teased and bullied on the way to school. Suddenly, it was as if my whole world changed. That image of my rich mother getting in the chauffeur limousine and being taken to school changed to my poor mother being harassed as a child on the way to school for who her great and great great grandparents were because this family had been in America for over a hundred years by then. When we first react and understand, we assume that other people's experiences are like our own, and that they see the world through the same eyes that we see the world. But if we listen and open ourselves to hearing their story, our perspective changes our understanding changes and we are free to see the other more clearly for who they are and to accept their view of the world as a legitimate view of the world perhaps not a totally correct view of the world just as ours is not a correct view of the world and we come to more deeply appreciate that as the children of God, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to be the people that listen, that hear, that come to understand, that expand our understanding so that we may reach out with arms of love and acceptance to others even those with whom we may disagree. Certainly yesterday, the 20th anniversary of 9-11, reminded all of us that this world of ours is very fragile. That this society that we presume daily is stable and the great America we have is fragile. And that in a split second, the world can change. As it does when someone gets news of bad health. As it does when an accident occurs. As it does when there's that horrible phone call that you don't want. Life is fragile. Life is a gift a gift from God to be treasured and lived to its fullest, but to always 
be recognized as being a gift and as being fragile. We are called to see that fragility and that gift in every other human being. And so I would urge you to think each day, who are you saying Jesus is today? Because like Peter, some days we get it right. And other days, just like Peter, we get it all so wrong. And it is so easy to put God and Christ in our image, in our understanding, instead of seeking to come to know God's will and God's understanding and Jesus Christ's understanding for us. Amen. Let us stand as we are able and reaffirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed.